Well, I want to welcome everyone to our soul session tonight and uh, with our special guest, Reverend Ann Lister, and I'm going to read you her bio. Uh, we, have, we have met before. She has been with her husband, Reverend Ronnie, to our Creative Life Center, and in fact, he was one of our uh, soul session presenters, I think, in 2021. Reverend Ann Catherine Bass Lister uh, joins us for this conversation principally about her work mentoring, supporting, and empowering young women who have mother wounds to grow and become their authentic selves. How appropriate that this is on the week following Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. Reverend Ann earned her bachelor's in English from Spelman College in 2007, where she graduated cum laude at 53 years of age. A divine encounter led Reverend Ann to Emory University, Candler's School of Theology, where she received a Master of Divinity in May 2010. Both schools are located in Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Ann was always clear that she was not called to pastor a traditional ministry. Therefore, after returning to Houston in 2010, she volunteered with the Ignatian Spirituality Project, working with persons challenged by drug and alcohol addiction a battered women's shelter, and as spiritual director for Kairos Outside Prison Ministry. In 2017, after acceptance into the clinical pastoral education training at St. Luke's Hospital, she discovered her chaplaincy gift, which led her to becoming a hospice chaplain after graduating from the CPE residency in 2018. Reverend Ann was ordained at the Hillside International Truth Center in Atlanta in 2019, let me ask you, was that before uh, Dr. Barbara King passed? Yes, it was. Yes, wonderful. She she was, a, I, I knew her back in the day, and yeah. we'll talk more about that. And Reverend Ann has authored a book, Love Spirations, in 2022, which is available on Amazon, and there's a link to that. Uh, those of you who receive our weekly email blast, there's a link to that. Uh, Amazon purchase site. So Reverend Ann, it's a delight to have you with us uh, tonight. And um, as I said on the, the week following Mother's Day, uh, I didn't know, we didn't know that that was the, the primary focus of your work and it just all came together beautifully. And there, there are, as Reverend Maureen kind of alluded to, there are no accidents and things happen for a reason and everything's coming together beautifully. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's talk about that. The, the woundedness that we, that we carry from childhood and how it impacts our, our lives going forward. You and I are both believers in the power of the mind to heal and and to set our destinies on a new course but we get in the way of that ourselves don't we with the, with the the trauma that we have uh, embedded within ourselves how do we how do we heal that what are the, what are some steps you'd recommend i would recommend first of all acknowledging it um and that that's the first step because i did not know when I was a young adult, I did not know what that I was wounded. I did not know because I didn't have that language. All I knew is that when my brother Craig passed away at, um, at 33 years old in 1995, I began to really search um, I, I, I began to ask questions about my life and, and evaluate my life. And so what I did is I surrendered. I surrendered to the God of my understanding and made the decision to do my work. I didn't even, I didn't know what it looked like. Um, I only knew at the time Oprah was talking about her childhood and a young Van Zant was on Oprah's talking about her childhood. And so I gleaned from them the information that I needed to start my journey. So I, I read, you probably are familiar, it's an old book, Melanie Beattie's Codependent No More. Yes. And that's how that's where I started. And I actually prayed a prayer, um, Reverend Jesse, that is 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 really phenomenal because it's because my husband showed up exactly like I prayed for him to show up. I asked 
the universe, divine love for a single man or either a, a single man with, with adult children or no children. Because I have one son and I did not want to get involved with a man who had a lot of children. And I asked for a spiritual man and I let it go. I prayed and I, I gave it to the divine. And that was in February of 1995. In November of 95, I was in Target department store on Greens Road. It's no longer there. And I heard this voice say, Annie Bass. Well, Bass is my maiden name, of course. And I turned around and it was Ron Lister. <laughs> Ron and I went to junior high school in Tucson, Arizona in the late 60s. I had not seen Ron in years. And so we exchanged phone numbers and the rest is history. He has been the perfect man for me because it's, 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 he didn't waste any time. We, he came into my life in November. We were married in August of 96. And the first thing he said to me is, and you really should continue, you really should get your education because I was working for United Airlines and, or it was co still continental, I think. And I, uh, I was comfortable. And so he had to do some convincing for me to go back to school at 48. And I, uh, he, he said, I'll, I'll go with you. We can go to Our Lady of the Lake um, and we can we, you can talk to a counselor and we can get you enrolled. So long story short, that is how that is how I uh, began this journey. And so it continues because what 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 has happened is I have learned that we heal in relationship. So because we all have trauma, we are all, uh, I used to think that was a generalization, but we all have trauma of some sort, but, the, but it's lying dormant and some is worse than others. And so in relationship with Ron, we have been able to push up against each other's trauma, trigger each other's trauma. And because we are who we are, because we made the decision to grow spiritually, we have dealt with it. We sit down, we talk about it. We move through it. We feel it. We don't hold it in. And so I believe that that is the best way for us to deal with any kind of trauma that we have, because it's not a bad thing. It's trauma is only something that happened to you in your life that was traumatic that was that was horrifying and because our bodies our minds are so smart because our bodies i'm learning are we're computers we placed it in a corner so we wouldn't have to deal with it at the time and we ignored it and went on until it was triggered and when it's triggered that's when you know when when, when somebody says something to you that you find uh, challenging and you explode, that's some unresolved trauma that you haven't dealt with. And so that has been, been my experience uh, with dealing with trauma. So it's the emotional intelligence idea, isn't it, that somebody who reminds you of something possibly completely inadvertently they resemble somebody from your past or a set of circumstances or a place or something brings this up and yeah. would, would you say i mean this is kind of glib but would you say that that's the price we pay for wanting to grow spiritually as we get to know more about ourselves warts and all i i wouldn't for me it it was not paying a price it was being liberated, being liberated, being free, having peace. Because the most important thing for me in my life today is peace of mind. 
Yeah. And and so now, you know, <laughs> the price that we have to pay is being exposed to everyone, to our mate and others. Uh, that is the price we pay because we lose people along the way. The people who are in my life who are just as traumatized as me no longer knew me. They no longer recognized yeah. me because I was different. And so I'm I'm gathering that's what you're you're asking me. That is the price you pay. You you lose people. But then as as you get as you continue to live, you realize those people needed to go anyway. It makes me think of, of Melody Beatty's work and also John Bradshaw, uh -huh. uh, who was a Houstonian, you know, and uh -huh. with the Center for Recovering Families. And uh, uh, he spoke about how a family is is like a mobile. Uh, or, I never say that word correct. Mobile or mo mobile, uh, uh -huh. where each one is hanging suspended by a, a thread connected to all the others hang. And when one person changes, and he used the example, when one person goes into recovery, uh -huh. It disrupts the entire family dynamic because when that person was addicted and active, active in their addictions, the rest of the family knew how to deal with them, uh -huh. developed coping strategies for dealing uh -huh. with them. Now they're back and, and uh -huh. they have an opinion and they're in the room and they're present. And now what are we going to do? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I understand. I now understand what you're, what you're saying. And that is very, very true. Um, I came up, I was raised in an alcoholic family system. And so I have, I have gotten the backlash after I began to grow and change and go my, 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 go in a different what route, go on a different journey. Um, it was very difficult for my, a couple of my siblings to to deal with the new me. It was very difficult for my mother to deal with the real me. Um, my mother um, being the perfectly imperfect woman that she she was would always call me clumsy. And I remember I was at her, uh, I had gone over to her place. We were going uh, to somebody else's to eat dinner and I was helping her carry the uh, whatever she had prepared to the car. And I almost fell and dropped one of the bowls. And she said to me, you're still clumsy. And I stood up and said to her, I am not clumsy. Don't ever say that to me again. And she looked at me like, well, and, and I, but I felt good. I felt good. It was, it was hard. It was really challenging, but I struggled through it because for me to be free was more important and more essential than my mother being upset because I responded to her uh, comment, putting me down. And and I knew that I wasn't clumsy. I had taken that on all my life. So yeah. Do you know a man named Bill Ferguson? Bill Ferguson. A, a, a trans a transformational worker here in Houston for many, many years, started out as a divorce attorney. And he wrote several books on how to divorce his friends. And then that led him into uh, leading workshops and seminars and and so on. I just thought you might have heard the name because he's local, mm -hmm. and I think he's retired from that work now. But why I bring him up is he. Long story short, because this is your hour. <laughs> he led a he led a long workshop I took, in which there was an experiential process, where we were given a list of. Um, offensive terms uh to react to mm -hmm. terms like clumsy uh -huh. stupid ugly that kind of thing mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And as our as the list was read to us, each one of us participating had a visceral reaction to one term, and the rest meant nothing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he said, that's what you're running from, that right there. And we were told to write it down, put it on a name tag, put the na- slap the name tag onto our chest, and, and then go around and introduce ourselves to everyone else in the room as, let's say, clumsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mine was phony. Mm-hmm. And so when you're phony, what you pr- spend your life doing is being very sincere wanting to appear very sincere, which is inauthentic. If you're trying to appear as something you don't feel yourself to be, you get the idea, you know? Oh, and, and so, so what I bring this up because what I hear you saying you did was you disempowered the term, uh, took your power back from the term. And so often he pointed out in, in the workshop, the people who accuse us of these things, they're afraid of these things themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe your mother her mother or somebody, uh-huh. it, it stuck in her mind. She dropped and spilled and broke something, and it it became a, a shameful kind of a thing instead of just accidents happen. Uh-huh. Wow, uh-huh. that's, yeah. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, because my mother, um, in, in the African-American community and some families, there's colorism. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But my mother is uh, was a little darker than her siblings and her mom, and she um, actually overheard her her mom telling a friend that she tried to scrub the black off of my mother with lye soap. And so, when my mother began to, when her her health began to fail and the dementia set in. She, I, I had her, I, I would take her to a, uh, it was a daycare for people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that I, I remember, it was like, um, it, it, it was like a mantra, mother's mantra. My name is not black gal. My name is Helen. She repeatedly said that while she, during her time there at the facility. And I knew that that was a source of pain for her, but she wasn't allowed to feel that pain. And so I began to, that's why I'm so grateful that I was chosen to take care of her because I understand her now. I understand what she went through. And even though my grandmother did apologize once mother became an adult, the damage had already been done. And so unfortunately, she will never know what it's like to heal through that and let it go because that is not where her mindset is. Her healing will be when she goes on the other side of the veil. Yeah. 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 And so, yes. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for um, for bringing that up because I really needed to share that um, because it's pervasive in in many of our our um, African American communities. Thank you for thank you for your your openness and your courage in, in sharing as we discussed a little bit before we came online here. You know, mm-hmm. you, you've you've been through, you've been through the ringer with uh, with her care, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, and and these scars that we that we carry from the generations, the transgenerational mm-hmm. yeah. material, yeah, and yeah. That, as 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 African Americans uh, or any marginalized group from the mainstream you've you've not been given the space to process these things right uh that that people who look like me have and right. that's in large part it's to heal that that we have sessions such as this uh-huh. Uh-huh. That, we, that we do that we do this work to create a world that works for everyone 
Yeah. And I think sometimes we hear that and we think it means where everybody has lots of money and everybody lives to be a hundred and, you know, but a world that works for everyone means everybody gets to work on their stuff on an equal, on a level playing field yes. and realize yeah. that we're so, we're so similar. As you say, mm -hmm. every family has trauma. Um, the class I'm teaching right now, uh, some and have in the past some people bring up how um things occurred in their family that were not that were like acts of god that were not uh -huh. anybody's fault uh -huh. somebody passed away for example and uh -huh. and they carry this sense of abandonment uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then uh -huh. they feel badly that they're blaming the person who got the cancer who passed away because they couldn't help it and it was just how things played out uh -huh. uh, and so there are all, all these levels of uh, consciousness going on in there that you have to get to the point, I guess, where you just thank God for God. The back of all of this, there's a place yes. where nothing has ever been wrong. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Pure, pure perfection. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to a young woman, to a mm -hmm. girl who is still in the family, in the nuclear family household, who may be accumulating these these uh, scars, these dents uh, as she goes through? Who's in? Who's a preteen or a teenager? What sort of advice or counsel would you give to not um, to not embed this trauma so deeply in herself that it, it it's going to take her ten or twenty years to come to terms with it? I'm always very honest um, with the the young women who come into my life. Um, just an example, a generic example, a young lady whose mom was angry and she was always afraid of her. Um, I share with I shared with her and with each of them who come to me that our mothers do the best that they know how with the information that they have. They went through what they went through with their moms and they it, it, it wasn't healed. And so they can't help but to pass it on to us. But we don't know what was going on in their life when, when they were carrying us in their wounds, when we were babies. We don't know what was going on. Just like we have things going on in our lives, so did our mothers. And so we have to find a place. And that that's why we have to do our work. Find a place to forgive them. And, 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 and do our best to try to develop a relationship with them that is more loving. We have to be the change that we want to see. Because one of the things that I've learned is I can't change anybody but myself. And now I really understand what Gandhi was saying when he said, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. We have to be the change that we want to see in our relationships by just acknowledging what was, it's the past, so we can't go back there. We have to go forward if we want to live our best life. And so we have to do the work. And that's what I encourage them to do. Do you subscribe to the idea that the child you once were still lives in you and that you can dialogue with her and and uh, make, uh, make arrangements, make... Um, uh, create, form a new relationship with her, make promises to her for her care, for her well-being, and have that have like a domino effect from the past of, of you up to the grown-up you today? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And yes, I, I have talks with my little girl all the time. I uh, I love on her especially when I'm going through something and she pops up. I love on her. There, um, 
not too long ago, I discovered a healer by the name of, I think her name is Tina Breedlove. And she had a very moving story. Um, Michael Beckwith interviewed her on Take Back Your Mind. And what really drew me in is that she said that her mom left her and her siblings. She, I think she had four of the siblings when she was five years old. And she said, I helped my mother carry her luggage downstairs and put it in the car. And she said, I stood on the porch and I watched her drive off. And she said, all my five-year-old body could do was sing, was hum. So I started humming. And then I watched her drive out of sight. I went back upstairs and I sang myself to sleep. And that's how I have gotten through life. So what, what she does, she, she's, she has um, retreats for women who have um, mother, mother wounds. And she teaches them how to deal with it, how to feel it, because we have to feel it in our bodies. And actually, Reverend Jesse, that's now I understand after hearing her, I understand the black church. I understand why our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers and aunts went to church on Sunday morning and shouted. I used to wonder as a kid, you know, you're you're sitting there looking at all these adults do things and you're you're wondering why are they doing this? They do this every Sunday. I realized after hearing Miss Reedlove that we had to fill it. We couldn't deal with it. So we had to do something to get relief from it. So we would shout, we would praise the Lord and shout and run around the church because we needed to do it for our sanity. In a safe place. Yes. With each other. Yes. Yeah. 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 Does it seem to you that our ancestors did that more naturally? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We we have been sort of um, over civilized, uh, over sophisticated, uh, distance from from the visceral. Um, yeah, I, I was raised in a very white church, uh, the Anglican Church, very mm -hmm. formal. It calls itself High Church, mm -hmm. uh, the closest thing to Catholic that isn't Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, this part of the world and sat in great cathedrals where everything happened way down front, uh, involved priests, uh, music, incense, candles, uh, and and you just sat there. Uh, you you knelt and you stood and you sat and you knelt and you stood and you sat. But there was no there was no talk back. There was no call and response. There was no visceral engagement of any kind. And which mm -hmm. is not to put it down. It worked for who it worked for. But it was. Mm -hmm. It was so um, kind of Elizabethan in, in structure. It's so very up in the head uh -huh. um, as as new thought can be, too, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Know, especially on on uh, Sundays, because we're, we're trying to get a complicated. I think for new thought, we're trying to get a complicated message across in 30 minutes that a lot of people haven't heard. So the experiential stuff, you have to create other other opportunities for that really than than Sundays but um yeah to just to just shout it out and and to feel the yeah to feel the feelings we have to work work through the feelings or yes, they yeah. come up uh come out sideways uh -huh. always yeah yeah they do so you were telling me earlier about your your mom and uh her her dementia uh, so let's talk a little, if you don't mind, a little bit about that for the benefit of people who might not have the experience of a relative with, with Alzheimer's. Um, mm -hmm. 
her memory comes and goes? Actually, it's gone completely now. She she knows before we moved her into the personal care home, she knew who I was. She knew that I was the person that took care of her, but she didn't know me as her daughter. And what I would what I learned to do is try to figure out things to engage her. And so mother loved gospel music. Like I said, she's, she sang in the choir all my life. She has a perfect alto voice, beautiful voice. And I sing soprano. So I would put on gospel and she remembered the words. Mm. They say that the words um, singing is the last thing to go. Um, she couldn't remember me. But she could remember Amazing Grace. And she sang it right on pitch. So I, that is how I engaged my mother um, by singing. But other than that, she did she didn't know, she didn't know me. She didn't know my my husband or my son, my um my son or my my siblings. They were just um people who were here who would come to visit her and um and so yeah which which was very it was something that i had to gradually work through because once she started forgetting me i uh forgetting who i was i did a lot of crying i did a, uh, some days i would just go in the other room and just cry, cry for her, cry for me, because it's very challenging to see a woman who was so vibrant and um, and friendly. Mother was a salesperson. She, she uh, sold fashion fair cosmetics at, at mm -hmm. Fulton's Greens Point when it used to mm -hmm. be Fulton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, her customers loved her because she had the gift of gab. And my mother was very honest. If you didn't want to know the truth, don't ask her because she's going to tell you the truth. And so I, um, we, we recorded her retirement party uh, when, when we used to have CDs. Thank God I have a CD player. So, so, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I played back her retirement party, hoping that it would spark a memory, but it didn't. Um, to see her, uh, to see her coworkers talking about how she, uh, she said they would say if if you want if you don't want the truth don't ask Miss Helen because she's going to tell you the real truth, and if she, if she doesn't want you hanging around her counter trying to get her customers she is going to tell you get away from my counter. <laughs> so so anyway, um, those are the things that that I really really. I hold on to um, because she really was a, a vibrant, a vibrant person. And so I encourage those who, um, who are dealing with parents that have um, dementia to, to focus on the good well, let me let me put it this way because it's it's both and because you have to have a balance in everything. I would say surrender to your feelings about what went on with you and your mom in the past. Surrender to those feelings. Feel them. But also find a way to be conscious about what you're doing. Be conscious about the fact that this is your this is your opportunity to be your mom's parent, literally, and love her through what she's going through. Mm -hmm. Because if she had a choice, she would not have chosen that. So that that is what I would like to, to leave everyone with. Um, it is so important. And I'm learning this just from my, my walk as a spiritual practitioner to to have more love, as, as, as Michael says, 
become a love revolutionary. Uh Because that is what we need in this world. And I remember when the Beatles sang, all you need is love. That's one of my favorite songs. Because even back then, I knew that there was something special, not about this romantic kind of love, but agape, unconditional love. And I also learned that in order for me to love like that, I had to first fall in love with myself. Because you cannot love if you don't have it within yourself. And so that is my motto today. Um, love and compassion, because that is the root of us moving into a new kind of world. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Brings to mind, I was teaching a course for our school of ministry over three Saturdays, ending about a month ago. And Mm -hmm. uh, one of the students in there is an affiliating minister who so he's been a minister for about 10 years but he's affiliating the centers for spiritual living he said that uh when he decided he wanted to be a minister he told an existing older minister mentor of his of his decision asked him what do you think and the mentor said asked him a question and the question was not uh, uh, of a linear nature, like, uh, do you really want to do this for a living? Uh, or, um, are you a good speaker or, uh, what kind of church do you want to have? No. The question the mentor asked him was, can you love everyone? Mm. Mm. And when he said this to us on, in a zoom setting like this, everyone, had the reaction you just had everyone just sucked it can you love everyone Mm -hmm. you might not have to like everyone you might not have to trust everyone you might have to not have to do business with everyone but you got to love everyone Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. or there's something missing wow yeah Yeah. Yeah. strong so you you um mentioned being a spiritual practitioner do you maintain an actual uh, practice with clients who seek you out for the healing of the, for the work on the healing of these wounds? Actually, the universe sends those people to me. They, um, they come from all different places and walks of life. It's like I attract them. Mm -hmm. And so that is when I had to start paying attention to who I am because I was, just taking it for granted that these young women were showing up in my life with all of these mother issues. And um, one of the, one of the, I think that one of the, the uh, I, this just came to my mind several years ago, I was invited into a group um it was it was a it was a circle of young women, millennial women, who gathered together once a month to talk about their issues and to be supported by the others. And so, the young lady that invited me to this meeting, she specifically said to me. Miss Ann, we want you to come and hold elder space for us. Mm. I was so honored, Reverend Jesse, because I'm like, they are inviting me. Millennials are inviting this almost 70-year-old woman into their space to hold elder space. That's huge. Yes. And they were very honest about what was going on in their lives. They were honest about their childhoods. And I'm telling you, Reverend Jesse, by the end, by the time that they finished sharing, I was I was doing the ugly cry. <laughs> because, because of what these young ladies had been through. And so 
I felt the need to get up and say to them, I apologize for all the ways in which your moms could not give you what you need, what you needed. I apologize on behalf of them because I'm a mom. And so that, um, that is how, how the divine has kind of uh, guided me through my gift. And I, I call myself a spiritual practitioner because I practice what I teach. Mm -hmm. I am, I am constantly working on me. I'm constantly meditating and, and, and affirming. I, one of the things that I love about uh, New Thought Ancient Wisdom is that there's the art of affirmations that I can, I can practice so to become a better human being, to be a better, um, more open human being. And so I'm grateful for that. Grateful. Beautiful. Just beautiful. I know in inner child work, there's a practice of selecting someone to represent so, uh, a figure from your past, mm -hmm. uh, whether they conform uh, gender-wise or age-wise to that. It's more an energy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And and you, you ask them for forgiveness and you grant them forgiveness in a dyad setting. And it's incredibly powerful to, to do that. Especially, I well, for me, it was having absent relatives. I had a father I didn't know. I had a grandfather who was the mm -hmm. matriarch of the family who died 20 years before I was born. People mm -hmm. like that, that I wanted to um, either uh, transact in a forgiveness way or transact in a gratitude-based way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's that is strong. What you what you mentioned about the young women and getting the millennials getting together, uh, it rang a bell for me, uh, uh, and you may have heard it. And I can't think of the names or any of this, but there was a there was a, a one woman who started these dinners. Mm. Uh, as soon as the pandemic, they started on Zoom during the pandemic, and as soon as the pandemic was over, they started physical dinners, and I think it was in the L.A. area. Wow! And it caught on, and there are now like 750 different locations around the world of these monthly dinners with millennial women That's or Gen, now Gen Z women, Gen too. Z. You know, uh, who who get together and talk about their feelings, and and uh, I think the the woman who started it has written a book, or somebody else wrote a book about her. But it's it's really a thing. And as I hear a story like that, I can't help but think again. This is what our ancestors did. Yeah, it's novel and remarkable. But our ancestors gathered around the bean pot on the fire, you know, and right out under the stars. Yes. And said what there was to say and work things out with the group. Yeah. Yes. And we're yes. circling back to that. And that's the ancient wisdom and who thought right. that Michael speaks of. You know, yes. This is this is our redemption. Yes. It's our human. Yeah. Wow. It is. it is. Yeah, this is this is wonderful. Um and how you mentioned, you know, people are just drawn to you. Uh, for this and you didn't you didn't go looking to build a client base it just it just happens that that organic nature is so so beautiful and so pure so yeah. pure that uh, uh I, you're familiar i'm sure with the name emma curtis hopkins uh yes. early new thought you know yeah she was asked one time by a student she says so having learned all of this that you've been teaching me uh is is there anyone going forward uh, that I cannot help that I will not be able to help and Emma Hopkins said to her if there is they will not come to you absolutely <laughs> they will very right? true <laughs> very true they will go where where their good is 
<laughs> and and you won't waste each other's time. That was part of it too. Yes. In in you know kind of fruitless conversation and, and all. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is very true because I since I have been back in Houston. I have had, uh, there are women here that I was really close to that I worked with for years and they're no longer in my life. It just didn't work out. It, it, it didn't work out because I changed. And, um, and so that is very, very true because I really believe they feel your energy when a person who is not vibrating, uh, at a higher frequency comes into your um space and you are smiling and joyful and and your energy is kind that makes a lot of people uncomfortable so i i i liken it to the scripture that says that um the wheat will be separated from the tear and it just happens it just happens automatically because people are only drawn to who they are unless they have an ulterior motive. I've been yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and, and as it, our friend Emerson said, what you are speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. Well, yeah. I see our, our uh, moderator has joined us again. Please, please moderate for us. I'm just giving you a 45 minute warning uh, and to ask if anybody who is still on has any questions. If not, please feel free to go back to the conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed the story about your mom mm. and her. I think it was interesting for me to listen to you talk how your mother was traumatized by her, her mother and then she came back and you know and it's like it's i have a friend who that's what that's her thing is is breaking that generational curse uh -huh. and how often we unintentionally visit trauma you know that that we haven't healed from on to the next generation yes so, yeah and we have to heal it to not Pass it on. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh -huh. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I'd like to say here, I want to talk about my son for, for a moment because my son and I are very, very close. His, his dad was a Vietnam War vet. And I am, I am very honest about my life. So, I got pregnant with my son at 16 and I had him at 17. Um, of course, his, his father married me because that was the thing that you did back in the um, late, back in the seventies. And um, it was, it was really a very, very um, turbulent marriage to say the least. And so our son has had a lot of scars and um, outside of the scars, he, he started having seizures. Mm. And um, so he grew up with epilepsy and he was very, very angry. His, his father, when I, when I decided to leave, his father decided to go to court to get custody of him. And um, I just knew that he wasn't. I had my my key wit witnesses and um, all of that. I just knew that the judge couldn't possibly give him uh, custody of our, of our son, but he did. And so I saw my son on during the summer. Well, when it got to the point where he couldn't handle him anymore, guess what? He sends him to me at 17. Angry, angry young man at 17 years old. And um it was it was it was very, very um it was very challenging. Very challenging. And he kept getting into trouble. 
fast forward about 10 years, he finally started settling down and going to counseling. I encouraged him. Uh, we both went, you know, I also went to counseling uh, around that issue. And now he is 51 years old and he is a phenomenal man. And the, the interesting thing is he's doing, he has the same gift that I have with young teenage boys. He works at Home Depot and he'll call me and he'll say, mom, he said, one of his, uh, one of his coworkers is, he's a young guy who's autistic. And he said, he said, I think I've ruined him, mom, because he's using all my sarcasm. On, on me. And so <laughs> I'm really, really proud of my son who went through counseling for 15 years um, so that he could be free to be who he is because, um, oh my God, the relationship between him and so his dad was volatile. It, it was, it was like, it was volatile. And so uh, I'm so grateful. So, so grateful that he and I both survived that and are able to have the relationship that we have uh, because he is my greatest, one of my greatest cheerleaders. And so I'm grateful. So thank you for, for bringing that up um, about us and our parents. I have sure. a question. Thank you for that, Ann. Mm -hmm. um, I too have a son that in under similar conditions, and he's now fifty two. So um, we do what we do, and it works out the way it's supposed to work out. It's usually way better than we can think. I'd like you to share a little bit about your journey into the ministry and your relationship <laughs> with the bishop, Doctor <laughs> Barbara King. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. You know what, PJ? I have to say that you, I attribute, I attribute that to you because spirit used you to guide me to Dr. Barbara King. She came to Houston and I, I had no idea that she was born and raised in Houston, but she came to Houston to speak at the uh, library. I'm trying to think of the name of the library. It used to be the Black School, but Gregory now- Gregory School. Gregory yes, School. Gregory School. And so she came to speak and PJ texted me and shared the information with me. And so I had always loved Dr. Barbara King. Um, I just, I loved her from afar because Ron and I lived in Atlanta. My all 10 years of my, well, I think it was 10 years we lived in Atlanta. And so I had visited her church. I had admired her from afar. So we go to hear her speak. And mother was with us at the time. She was, she wasn't, she hadn't really progressed. Her disease hadn't really progressed that, that much. And um, after we, after she spoke, Ron and I went up and introduced ourselves. And so she and Ron had a great conversation about Howard Thurman. She said, who knows, maybe you're the new Howard Thurman. And we kind of had a laugh about it. And she asked what we were doing, what, what kind of ministry we were doing. And she, um, we shared with her what we could because there were, there were a lot of people greeting her. And she said, why don't you email me and just give me an overall um a summary of what you and your husband do in ministry. So I did. And she responded. And Spirit said, ask her if she will ordain you. Because I didn't know where I fit. I We were, at the time, we were attending Unity, Unity Church. Um, I did not want to re, I didn't want to go and learn, I didn't want to go back to school to um, to be a minister in a different uh, group 
spiritual group. So I said, I'm going to have to navigate this the best that I can. So I, when I met her and we had that exchange, I asked her if she would, would ordain me. And she said, yes. And I was ex so ecstatic. I, I didn't know what to do. I was, it was like meeting James Brown. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so long story short she said yes to to my ordination she um had her um administrative assistant call me we set it up and i was ordained in 2019 at hillside and it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life she wasn't able to do it, but one of her ministers uh, did it because she had just come back from from uh, Africa and she was not doing well. She was sick. And um, anyway, yes, PJ, that my meeting Barbara King was was um, as a result of spirit using you to to guide us there. Thank you for asking that. I just love hearing that. What is it, the, the, the quote that says, uh, uh, when preparation meets or something, yeah. you have done all of that work. And yeah. maybe some of those other people fell away from your life, but look at who you have become. Yeah. It just means so much to see you. Now and thank you for everything you've shared tonight. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Reverend Jesse, Reverend Ann, I have this a has question. been delightful. Here's a question from Sandy. Yes. Okay. Um, my question is, oh, I don't know what the where the light is in my room. Thank um you. the your your journey from I'll say hurt hurting to healing, I'll put it that way, uh -huh. Uh -huh. is phenomenal. In my case, I stumbled upon the path. I moved back to Texas to help my mother. And I thought, well, if you don't move back when your mother's 90, when are you going to move? Well, little did I know that the emotional housekeeping that needed to be done had to be done here because I couldn't run and go home and say, okay, bye, see you. I had to I face it. I was in a rural community, away from everything, no job, no nothing, and nobody was coming, and I had limited opportunities to get away. So I stumbled upon the, the, the pathway that ended up being five, six, seven, eight years of prayer session, uh, um, workshops, uh, reading, um, lecture, all of this, but it, in my mind is kind of a long way around, but I am there yeah. and I wouldn't give anything for my journey right now, as they say, but if you have a suggestion for how someone could get started and how they could find the path. Uh, I, I would appreciate it. I literally stumbled upon mine. It was so painful that I could not continue enduring it. And I just thought life, God has a better plan than this for me. And mm -hmm. so I just kept praying for clarity, 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 clarity. I think for a year and a half, that was my constant prayer. Mm -hmm. But what suggestions do you have for somebody who recognizes the need to clean up their life? and don't really know where to begin? I believe, uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Sister Sandy. I believe that it's all in the surrender. And the surrender has to be authentic. As I used to, um, I used to work with drug addicts also. And the, the saying was, you gotta be sick and tired of being sick and tired of the life that you're living, and who you are. And once you are sick and tired, and once you surrender to that, spirit guides you where you need to go. 
you may be driving uh, on a Sunday morning, meeting a friend for, for breakfast and finish your breakfast and decide to stop at a church or a, or a spiritual center or whatever. Because what I know is when we're sincere, spirit will guide us. Because when we're sincere, we're listening. Because it's all about listening to what spirit is telling you and being in tune with spirit. And that that is really the best way to start. Um, I don't know any other way. You have to be ready. You have to be ready. Um, sick and tired of being sick and tired. And spirit will show you the way, even if it means you going somewhere and not having um, other people to interact with. So you have, you're with yourself. You end up being alone with yourself. And so when we're with ourselves, we got to be real. And we know what to do. And that's the best way I can answer that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's interesting that you should talk about talk about the lessons lessons. I I at one time would get a, a chuckle because I wasn't working, I wasn't in a work environment, I wasn't, you know, dating anyone consistently, I wasn't, you know, finding it. And I thought to myself oh, very often, if God has a message for me. He would put it on a billboard between Kendleton and Houston coming up 59, because that's where I was going. <laughs> and very, very, very often, my book is going to be about the, 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 the way clarity was unfolded in front of me, through me, and, and around me. That's and, in a way that I never could avoid. I did not know how to ask for all the blessings and the clarity uh, that... I, I have received and yeah. uh, peace beyond peace beyond anything that I could have ever uh, above and beyond anything I could ever have thought or imagined. So yeah. I, I'm grateful yeah. for you. And this has been so rewarding just to hear you tell your story. So uh, encouraging, so uplifting. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Sandy. Thank you. It has indeed been wonderful, Reverend Ann. Thank you so much for your time with us tonight. Please give our, all our love to Reverend Ronnie. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing both of you in the flesh just as soon as possible. Yes, you will. Are there any further questions or comments from any of our team? No, I just want to say thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Reverend, I guess. What you said is so much on point with so many people these days. Mm -hmm. I my my father died when I was four, so I grew up. My mother was a single mother, so I mm -hmm. saw a lot of the world from her standpoint, and I saw how she was treated and she shouldn't have been treated. And I think mm -hmm. it actually helped me to see the other side. But hearing your story and what really amazed me is, you know, how open you were about your struggles. So mm -hmm. thanks very much for that. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Maya Angelou said, "When you, when you, um, when you heal, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it backward. But anyway, the gist of what she said is that what I, and, and it's what I took seriously. When you learn, here it comes, teach, and so." When I learned my lessons, it was really important for me to teach. I couldn't teach everybody because not everybody wants to hear. Not everybody wants to learn. So I went to those that were ready and open to hearing. So I appreciate, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Danny says amen. <laughs> Well, again, Reverend Ann, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And uh, uh, 
We will make sure that when this goes up on Facebook, we'll put your contact information there so oh. others can reach out to you and also ordering information for your book. Um, Love Spirations. Mm -hmm. Where I saw that Maya Angelou quote uh, yes. that you just, you just mentioned. Yes. yes. So yes. thanks so much. You're welcome.